Vaccinology professor Shabir Mahdi has been at the coalface in the hunt for a COVID-19 vaccine and herd immunity that would return our world to normal. His research unit at the University of Witwatersrand brought us the results a week ago. The vaccine they were testing last year was ineffective against a variant that emerged here in December. We've invited him into the studio to unpack some of the complex science and answer some of the burning questions from our audience on where the vaccine fits into the big picture. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for having me, Derek. We had an extensive interview during the AstraZeneca trials. Were you even thinking of a mutant, a variant at that stage? Uh, I don't think there's any scientist that could have guessed that a variant such as the one that evolved in South Africa and the one that's evolving in Manaus in Brazil would have happened as soon as it happened. Uh, viruses mutate all the time, partly because of errors in terms of reading of the genetic material as they replicate. Uh, but what happened caught almost all scientists uh, off guard. But what does this mean, Professor? Does it mean as you start winning the battle, then you've got to look for another enemy? Uh, well, you need to look for another tool to try to combat what might be a new enemy. Uh, and that's essentially what we're facing right now. And the main reason why this variant uh, developed this sort of resistance is probably because of the high force of infection that took place in South Africa the first time around we up to about 25 to 30 percent of the population were likely infected. And under those sort of conditions, the virus comes under attack from those antibodies. And for the virus to continue surviving, it needs to mutate to be able to evade that immunity. So it becomes complex, especially including when you start rolling out vaccines. If you're sluggish with the rollout of the vaccine, you basically could head down a similar sort of pathway in that the virus will start mutating if your rollout of vaccine is not rapid enough. Okay, so have we been overcautious in um, halting, for the moment, the rollout of AstraZeneca? Look, the World Health Organization has uh, sort of pronounced on it, and they've indicated that even where the variants such as the one in South Africa circulates, countries should continue using the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the reason for that, I think we need to be clear about the South African study. When you do a study, you're trying to test a particular hypothesis. The hypothesis that we were testing was whether this vaccine could prevent COVID with at least 60% or greater protection. Yeah. If the protection is less than 60%, we don't have an answer. Our study is not designed to give an answer. But compounding that is that almost all of our cases that contributed to our analysis ended up being mild or moderate infection. So we are unable to make any determination as to whether this vaccine would protect against severe disease. But when we chatted earlier, you feel that there is strong evidence to show that it could be uh, effective against serious forms of the variant. Right. And that's the reason WHO has made an announcement that they suggest continue using the AstraZeneca vaccine. The basis of that is the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine use identical technology, in addition to which the antibody responses to these two vaccines after a single dose are almost identical. All other things equal. Had the AstraZeneca vaccine been evaluated, had, had it been evaluated in the same sort of population demographic as the Johnson & Johnson study, we, would it, we might have had another answer. But what we do know right now is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine definitely protect, has at least an 89% efficacy against severe disease in South Africa, mainly against the variant. So biologically, it's difficult to conceptualize how two vaccines that use the same sort of technology that induce a similar sort of immune response would perform so differently in terms of protecting against the same spectrum of disease. You're saying to me that it's likely that the AstraZeneca will be effective. Against severe disease, I think highly biologically probable, uh, basically because of the reason I explained. So I come back to the point, should we be delaying it? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think the reality is that South Africa is going to be faced with a choice, and just one of two choices. Uh, unless we're going to be able to get large quantities of vaccine uh, before the next uh, resurgence occurs, and my estimate is around about May to June, uh, it doesn't actually make sense to actually withhold the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, not for gen the general population, and that's important, including the, John the AstraZeneca vaccine. But we need to recalibrate what we can expect of the current vaccines, these first-generation vaccines. These first-generation vaccines are not going to be what's going to take us to that mark of so-called herd immunity. We need to recalibrate in the context of the type of variants that are circulating, and right now, the focus needs to be targeting at-risk groups for severe disease, irrespective of whether the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. 
In fact, you're saying that uh, to some extent we must uh, lose our, our goal of uh, herd immunity. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to transpire with the current generation of vaccines. There's one vaccine thus far that shows some potential in terms of protecting against mild and moderate infection, and that was also evaluated in South Africa by our group, and that was a Novavax vaccine, where we had a 60% efficacy against mild and moderate infection. Uh, for a vaccine to be able to reduce infectiousness, you usually expect it also to be able to work against mild and moderate infection, especially mild infection. If it doesn't work against mild infection, highly unlikely is going to be reducing infectiousness. But your main aim has to be to stop uh, hospitalizations and death. Correct. And that's where, what the focus needs to be right now. It really needs to be about vaccinating high-risk groups so we can prevent hospitalizations, relieve pressures on our healthcare facilities, and minimize the number of people that die. But it requires a different mindset in terms of who we're going to vaccinate and for what purpose. We're not vaccinating any longer to get to herd immunity. And in fact, if we can reduce hospitalization and death significantly, we actually don't need to continue wearing a face mask for the next three years. Absolutely. Because the, the virus itself would be sort of analogous to a seasonal influenza virus in terms of how we manage that. Each year, seasonal, influ seasonal influenza kills about 11 to 12,000 South Africans. And that's where we need to be targeted. So we would have to tweak the vaccine every year like we do with the flu vaccine? Well, we might well. It's difficult to tell what this virus is going to do next. But like I said, unfortunately, if you're sluggish with your rollout of the vaccine, then you lend yourself to further mutations evolving, which become resistant to the vaccines. Right. Let's get to some uh, viewer questions. Stacey Roper, uh, if we delay the vaccine for too long, what are the implications of the virus mutating further? and the vaccine's becoming even more ineffective. Will we ever get out of this lockdown then? You've answered part of that question. Yes, I think we're going to get... Uh, it, needs to, it needs for us to recalibrate, not only about who we target vaccines to and for what purpose. It also needs... We need to recalibrate in our thinking on the COVID pandemic and what is it that we're actually able to achieve without destroying livelihoods. And right now, we're heading, we're heading into a different era in terms of our understanding of the COVID pandemic and we need to be repurposing uh, the tools we've got, and we need to decide exactly what it is we want them to do. We're not wanting to eradicate COVID-19. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. It's unlikely to happen in your lifetime. That is no longer on the table. What mm. is on the table is having effective tools to prevent people from getting severe disease and to protect people from dying. From Kim Sales, why did the government and uh, MAC, that's the Ministerial Advisory Committee, take so long to negotiate bilateral uh, procurement deals with the leading vaccine candidate manufacturers? Good question. Uh, good question. I think initially governments focused on, on trying to source vaccine through the COVAX facility, uh, but subsequently, uh, earlier this year at least, it became much more intensive uh, in terms of engaging in bilaterals. So it was uh, slow off the mark compared to other countries. Uh, and you can argue the, the merits of it. Uh, but certainly, the countries that have been able to get large, quant large quantities of vaccine at an early stage are countries that basically entered into these bilaterals in June of last year, rather than left it until the results of the studies came out. Prof, we're almost out of time, but I want to say to you, you have, for many of us, we are bombarded. Different vaccines, different efficacies, um, different... Um, you know, storage temperatures, you know, it's too much at times. What should we, how should we lead our lives? Should we just leave it to the scientists? Well, I think a good place to start is to try to avoid social media uh, and you'd be less confused. Uh, I think if you just decide to focus on two or three different sources of information, be it the NICD, be it the National Department of Health, or in fact, the New York Times or the Washington Post, they are brilliant sources of really good information and then you would save yourself a lot of anxiety. <laughs> Professor, thanks so much for coming to the studio. Really appreciate it. And all the best to you and your unit uh, on the arduous uh, journey ahead. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for watching our stories here online. And please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.